You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. John is joined by Edwin Kite and Robin Wordsworth. Edwin Kite is an associate professor at the Solar System and Exoplanet Habitability Research Department at the University of Chicago. He is a planetary scientist who studies the evolution of rocky planets. He is a member of the Mars Curiosity Rover Science Team, a co-recipient of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, Newcomb Cleveland Prize for the Most Outstanding Paper Published in Science and a recipient of the American Geophysical Union Greeley Early Career Award in Planetary Science. Robin Wordsworth is the Gordon McKay Professor of Environmental Science and Engineering at Harvard University. Professor Wordsworth's research is focused on the processes that shape planetary climate and habitability both in the solar system and around other stars. His currently active research topics include the changes in Mars's climate and atmospheric chemistry over geologic time, the behavior of convection, clouds, and precipitation on Earth and other planets, and observational techniques for detection of surface liquid water and biospheres on rocky exoplanets. Robin Wordsworth and Edwin Kite, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thanks, John. It's good to be here. Now, gentlemen, we live in perhaps the first era where we can actually even start talking about this as far as realization instead of just dreaming about eventually, in one way or another, making Mars more like Earth and creating something that's a little bit friendlier to humans. And here we have two ideas. And the first is you, Robin, with aerogels and how you could make local habitability for photosynthetic life on Mars to begin the process of terraforming. Tell us about that idea. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, maybe a good starting point is just to, to say why Mars is not currently habitable. So, it's a it's a fascinating planet, Mars, in, in so many ways. It's in some ways remarkably like Earth, but in other ways really, really different and alien. And so, the atmosphere is much thinner. It's only a few percent of the, the, the total pressure of Earth's atmosphere. So liquid water is not stable. If you put a glass of water on the surface of Mars, it would, it would just it, it, would, it would boil away and not be stable. And temperatures are also, on average, they, they vary a lot, but on average, they're much, much lower. There's additional things that, that affect habitability, but those two are probably the most important. And so if you're thinking about having a long-term presence, human presence on the surface and how you could sustain habitability and particularly photosynthetic life, so plants and, and so on to sustain life, then you have to think about how you can raise temperatures uh, up to the point where that life would be able to flourish. And so the solid state greenhouse idea actually originally comes from a from a natural phenomenon that we observe on Earth and we think we observe on Mars as well. And it happens when you have sunlight getting that, that gets transmitted into a material that's, that's translucent, but has a ability to block infrared radiation. So a solid state, state greenhouse material acts as a really incredible greenhouse warming agent over small distances, so typically a few centimeters. And different materials are, are better or worse at this, but silica aerogel is one that we identified that has particularly strong potential to, to cause large amounts of warming by this effect. So the idea with silica aerogel is that you, you wouldn't be trying to globally transform Mars. You would be enabling local regions of habitability using materials that either at the very beginning you brought along with you or over time you, you learned to manufacture on the Martian surface. And so that would enable you to, to create portions of the surface where underneath temperatures were essentially Earth-like. And so it's a kind of local regional approach to, to achieving habitability. And it's translucent, so you can let sunlight in for the photosynthesizing bacteria, and then you just also retain the heat. Now, how far above the surface of Mars would you need to place this? I mean, can it just sit directly on the Martian soil, or do you have to suspend it any distance above it? Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of depends on what you're trying to grow, but there's a fair amount of flexibility because... If you're thinking about growth of something like like algae, which has all sorts of biotechnological purposes that you you would care about on Mars, then you could imagine lying more or less flat layers of this on the surface and, and, and having growth chambers underneath. 
you would have to have some additional material underneath to, to sort of separate the, the aerogel from from the liquid water, but it wouldn't be necessary to, to elevate it necessarily. If you're trying to grow something like plants, then you could imagine constructing a dome that would, would be more like the kind of images we're used to seeing from, from sci-fi on uh, for, for growth on the Martian surface. But it would depend on your application. You would want some structural materials present there as well to, to keep the aerogel in place. Yeah, especially since aerogel is notoriously light. <laughs> so you wouldn't want to, I know Mars's atmosphere, it's it's got wind, but it isn't like here. But it does remind me of a greenhouse, just like we would build here when grow tomatoes in. Only it's a, it seems to be a much larger, broader possibility where you could have an entire field, you know, covered in this aero, suspended aerogel and whatever else you need to go with it. The question is, though, is, all right, Mars' atmosphere is thin. So with the carbon dioxide that's there, is that enough for photosynthesizing uh, algae or something like that? Is that enough for it? Or would you have to add in some kind of booster? That's a great question. And the short answer is on its own, no. There's there's one, at least one more thing that you have to do, and that is to raise pressures to the point where, where liquid water is going to be stable. So as I mentioned at the beginning, the, the current pressure is so low that you're you're below the the triple point of water, which means that the the, the stable forms of H2O are solid or vapor. You you have to raise pressures if you want to have liquid water, and so to to achieve that, you you would need a thin layer of something that can raise pressures by some small amount. And so we're not talking about raising to Earth like one bar pressures because it turns out that most plant life and certainly bacteria and algae don't require anything like pressure elevation that high. You just have to get it to the point where, where liquid water is going to be stable. And so you need some material that, that is um, going to be strong enough to, to allow that to happen. But the, the strength requirements, they're, they're not particularly onerous. You're talking about, I mean, a lot of common plastics, for example, a layer a few millimeters thick would be sufficient to do that. Now, Dr. Kite, your idea is more global. And it is to actually start putting in additive nanorods, metallic nanorods, very, very tiny ones, and suspending them in the atmosphere of Mars to raise the temperatures, presumably globally. Tell us about that idea. So when both for the aerogel concept and for our global warming concept, when we talk about habitability, we're talking about simple forms of life. So photosynthetic algae, perhaps plants, but these are not ideas that by themselves could produce a human breathable atmosphere. That's a much more ambitious goal and require longer timescales. So similar to Robert, we were inspired by observations of things that nature does. So a really important agent in Mars's modern climate is a natural mineral dust aerosol. It's blown around by the wind to high altitudes. It's spread globally. There are dust storms every few Earth years which uh, span the planet. And that dust, because of its size and composition, has the effect of reducing dayside temperatures and reducing the chances of liquid water. So we asked, well, if you engineered dust-like aerosols, so dust size or smaller, to warm the planet, what shape and composition would it have to warm the planet most effectively? And actually, there are several classes of particles that can do the job. In our first paper, we emphasized metal rods. And it turns out that they can warm Mars globally very effectively, about 5,000 times more effectively on a per unit mass in the atmosphere basis than greenhouse gases. But even though they're much more mass effective than previous proposals, we're still talking about a minimum mass in the atmosphere of hundreds of thousands of tons. And so this would require a lot more initial investment to get things going uh, than in the aerogel proposal. And it's interesting because with Mars, say you're using iron, Mars has plenty of iron <laughs> right there. <laughs> you know, it's an iron oxide planet and also ironically loaded with iron meteorites, it seems. So your materials are right there. So mining this, we would basically, at least my understanding is we would basically only need to send, say, 14 starships, I believe you you said on uh, in a uh, presentation, worth of equipment to actually mine this and start this process. So what's the time frame? I mean, could we do this by 2030 or 2040 when we actually have human uh, feet on Mars? 
Oh no, you need a lot more than that. The number you're referring to is uh, for a preliminary test or precursor or demonstration. So in our paper, we do talk about how much material you would need to process to bring out the required amounts of metal. And we emphasized aluminum, which is also abundant in mass soil. And so in the, in the paper, the number we get is a, a mine that's a few hundred meters wide and lengthens by a, a few hundred meters per year. So that's uh, well within the range of what we do on Earth. But establishing that kind of infrastructure on Mars would require a lot of effort. So more than 14 starships. So let's say the SpaceX plan works and we end up with a million people on Mars. <laughs> or yeah, I don't know if it'll ever be that number, but that I believe is what he originally envisioned. And if you have that level of a colony, which probably is going to take quite a while to actually accomplish. But if you think big, once this process has started with the uh, nano rods, how fast can you bring Mars's temperatures to a human comfort zone, or at least a, a photosynthetic life comfort zone? Yeah, absolutely. So the goal is habitability. So there are three time scales to consider. The first is if you change the energy budget of Mars, how long does it take for the soil to warm and the atmosphere to warm up? And that's relatively fast. And taking into account the needs to build up infrastructure, I think decades is a reasonable target. But there are other speed limits to consider as well. As Robert mentioned, building up pressure is important. And the most accessible big reservoir of carbon dioxide that would be released into the atmosphere as you warm Mars up is carbon dioxide at the polar caps. But it would take at least a century for all of the carbon dioxide in the polar caps to be released into the atmosphere. And the result will be an atmosphere that is still not breathable for humans. It will be a carbon dioxide atmosphere still thin by Earth standards. And so then there's a third time scale, which is both the longest and also the least certain, which is the time scale for photosynthetic life once it's got a toehold to convert water into oxygen. And based on how slow that process goes on Earth, that would be many centuries, at least perhaps longer, to build up an atmosphere that was breathable for humans. So this is still fundamentally, if you're talking about changing the household of an entire planet, you, it's a slow multi-generational process. But we always knew that because previous ideas of terraforming Mars involved greenhouse gases, you know, in, in other words, releasing water vapor and carbon dioxide and everything else. But looks like we need a little bit more than that. And that time scale for that was thousands of years <laughs> to get Mars to something like habitability. But these ideas tend to shorten it. Now, Robin, yours is more short term. So how do we get the aerogel? to Mars, and could we conceivably make it there? Yeah, so th the advantage of aerogel is that it's light, and of course, mass is money as soon as you get into Earth orbit and beyond. It's high volume, so so that's a consideration for transport from Earth. But of course, in the even medium term, if you were thinking about this over any kind of serious area, you would, you would want to think about manufacturing it on the surface. And so the way silica aerogel is made currently for, for purposes on Earth today, and I should add actually that aerogel is something which is being very actively considered for sustainable buildings on Earth. So, so it's, there's a pretty vigorous area of research for this, for sort of Earth sustainability applications. So the, the way it's manufactured is that you there's there's a few chemical steps that, that need to be done to, to get to the point of forming the, the aerogel as a hydrogel, which just is a the kind of gel we're more familiar with, a, a gel in, in water or some other chemical. And then you need a supercritical drying step where you, you process it with high pressure CO2. Of course, CO2 is abundant uh, on Mars, so that in itself is not a problem. The chemical structure of the air, standard silica aerogel itself is just SiO2, so silicon and oxygen are also both very commonly available on Mars. But in this in this scenario, this would be a kind of industrial process that would be required to manufacture it. One thing we're really curious about at the moment, which currently is still something that, that's a little speculative, but we're, we're actively researching it, is that there's there are teams which have developed um, aerogels based on organic materials. So, so there's 
nanocellulose aerogels, for example. And so conceivably, these could be created from organic feedstocks, which raises a kind of intriguing possibility that you could have a habitat which is producing biomass and then can be used to produce the raw materials for more stuff to construct more habitats. So a kind of semi-closed loop system. So I think that's a really interesting possibility for the future. Is there a possibility to use these aerogels beyond this? In other words, say you want to... Um say you want to build a dome, you know, <laughs> for, for the humans to live in, can you, would aerogels work with that as well, given how light the, the potentials here are versus other materials? Oh, absolutely. So yeah, if you, if you want to create habitats for humans, then aerogels will, will certainly get you to the temperatures that you need. We humans are, are, are quite sensitive. And so, uh, of course, we have requirements beyond just being at the right temperature. The pressure needs to be higher, as Edwin was mention, mentioning, we, we have much more stringent requirements on on CO2 and O2. And then there's the other long-term issue for Mars, which is radiation. And, and so humans on the surface of Mars for long periods, we're, you have to worry about radiation exposure. This is why some of the, many of the concepts you see for humans living on Mars, at least in the beginning, have, have people in subterranean habitats. But there, there may be possible ways to mitigate that in the future as well. This is also an ongoing area of research. Now, Edwin, do you see a way that these two methods could be hybridized in a colonization effort of Mars? Do you, I mean, can we use both of these ideas in tandem to create a uh, situation of improving Mars for habitability? Yes, I think both are worthy of further investigation. Robin has already done some experiments, and uh, we're hoping to start uh, small-scale patch testing experiments for our concept. And uh, there are other ideas out there as well. For example, Casey Hammer has suggested launching solar sails into Earth orbit and then using the solar sails to fly to Mars orbit where they act as mirrors while in Mars orbit to increase the amount of sunlight reaching Mars's surface. So that's another additional intriguing possibility. So the needs of the very first people to arrive on Mars will be relatively modest. And so at that point, there's no need to globally warm the planet. And so that could be a period of testing and risk reduction for global warming methods. One thing that Rob and I are both interested in is natural climate feedbacks. As you warm a planet up, the natural water cycle, so the release of water vapor from Mars's polar caps, formation of water ice clouds and so on will intensify. And it will be interesting to see whether or not that provides a boost to the engineered warming. So that's just an example of how a lot of testing and development will be needed before full-scale global warming. Testing and development, and it, it has to be said, you know, uh, climates are very complex, as we know from our planet. And Mars is probably going to present interesting challenges that are unforeseen, I would imagine. But do you think it's an easier not to crack than Earth's really wildly <laughs> complicated atmosphere as opposed to Mars's relatively seemingly straightforward one? So humans are currently altering the climate of an entire planet, our Earth. It's inadvertent, but it's a big change. And it the, the Mars system is simpler in some respects. For example, Mars lacks an ocean, and the distribution of heat in the ocean was a major uncertainty in global warming calculations uh, in the first decade of this century. But then you have to have respect for the size of the change that you're talking about. So human-induced inadvertent warming of Earth is only a few percent in terms of the whole planet energy budget. Whereas if you want to make Mars habitable on a global scale, you're looking at maybe a factor of two change in the whole planet energy budget. And so I think it would be premature to say that we can trust computer models fully in that regime, and a slow step-by-step -step approach would be the best one. Now, of course, when people are going to ask, and I'll ask it right now, magnetosphere, Mars's magnetosphere, it's non-existent other than weird local disturbances, thing like, things like that, but it has no dynamo, it's shut down. With your idea, would a magnetosphere be required? I know Jim Green has come up with a, a relatively straightforward way to equip Mars with an artificial magnetosphere. And how is that playing into this? And then I will also ask that question to you, uh, Robin, here in just a moment. 
Yeah, we've learned a lot about atmosphere loss processes from Mars just in the last few years, thanks to European spacecraft and the NASA MAVEN mission. Hopefully, we'll learn a lot more in the coming years from the Escapade spacecraft, which is currently at the pad awaiting launch by the first flight of the new Glenn rocket. But what we've learned so far is that the atmospheric loss processes from Mars are extremely slow. And also, there's no reason to believe that they would speed up as the result of warming the planet up. So that means that the atmosphere would remain on Mars for at least millions of years. That's conservative in a warmed up scenario. Robin? Yeah, I, I, I certainly agree with all of that. I think it's this interesting point, there's timescales and then there's timescales, right? And we were talking a bit earlier about some of the long by human standards timescales for thinking about Mars global climate alteration. Atmospheric loss is even longer timescales still. I guess I would add that actually in planetary science, it's still this really interesting question, how much a magnetosphere is needed to preserve an atmosphere. There's some indications from modeling that there are situations where a magnetosphere protects the atmosphere of a planet, but other models suggest magnetospheres can even enhance escape in, in some circumstances. And of course, we have a classic example of a planet in our solar system that, that has no magnetosphere, has a thick CO2 atmosphere, and that's Venus. Hey, very thick. <laughs> Venus is a completely different animal. And uh, let me ask you that. Do you have any ideas, Robin, on doing something with Venus eventually? Because other than that atmosphere, it's a rather attractive planet. Yeah, other, other than that atmosphere, right? It's, it, it could all be so simple. Yeah, Venus is not something we've thought a ton about so far. There's definitely interesting historical ideas on this. I think if, if you were serious about converting Venus into a habitable planet, there's the question of what you do with that, that large amount of CO2. There's also the fact that certainly in the atmosphere that there's, that there's hardly any water. If you take all the water in Venus's atmosphere and you were somehow able to compress it down to liquid water on the surface, spread out as, a, as an even layer, you're talking about a few centimeters in total. So it's a, it's a very, very dry world currently. So you would need to, some of the proposals have involved increasing albedo, so you, you somehow condense CO2 out on the surface, but I think you would really need some way of, of getting water in from other parts of the solar system and, and delivering it. I mean, one of the interesting things, another interesting thing about Venus is that it's got this, this crazy 92 bar CO2 atmosphere, so vastly more carbon dioxide than is present in Earth's atmosphere. But the total carbon dioxide inventory of Earth, if you account for what's in the crust as well, is actually fairly similar. The estimates are kind of of order 60 bars or so. And so Earth has tons of carbon dioxide as well. It's just that the majority of it is in the crust and interior of the planet, not, not in the atmosphere. The carbon cycle. And it's a good thing because <laughs> Earth would, it's a very good thing for us. And anyway, now... You say increasing albedo, in other words, making Venus brighter as a way to cool it. Do you think we could actually apply that to Earth? In other words, do you think we could apply just slightly raising the albedo, more clouds or something, and start to reverse terraform this world? Yeah, so that that's an idea that people are thinking seriously about currently. It's It's controversial, but people are thinking very seriously about it. There's a, a kind of the broad spectrum of, of techniques is, is called solar geoengineering. So it's it's this idea the, basically rather than removing CO2 from the atmosphere or at, at the same time as reducing CO2 emissions and perhaps removing CO2 through geoengineering, you also do something to the atmosphere. And, and the most common idea is you put sulfate aerosol particles up there. And so it's a way of temporarily mitigating some of the consequences of climate change. And so I think even uh, proponents of solar geoengineering would say this is like a, a temporary fix. It's not something that we would want to do as it's no substitute for reducing CO2 emissions. But maybe, maybe mid-century, if things get bad enough, it, it might be a way to, to reduce some of the worst effects of, of climate extremes at the same time as we're, we're transitioning to a, a global zero carbon economy. Now, any additional thoughts on that, Edwin? Yeah, I uh, agree with everything Robin said. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences did a consensus study report 
recently on recommendations for solo geoengineering research. And as Robin said, uh, the, the, the author said that uh, we should take a close look at this and the U.S. should develop a transdisciplinary research program and collaborate with other nations to advance understanding of solar geoengineering's technical feasibility and effectiveness because we might need it. And if we do, we'll really need it. So we better figure out how we would deploy it if we need to. Now, Edwin, in regards to a terraformed Mars, and, you know, as you say, you know, you would have this atmosphere for millions of years, even without really having to pay so much attention on a magnetosphere. What about ultraviolet light? So (laughs) the sterilization effect, what can we do to mitigate the sun's ultraviolet? Yeah. So I should say, by the way, that millions of years is conservative. My best guess is that it would be billions of years. And that is consistent with um, our current best models, but a lot longer than the other timescales that we're discussing, as Robin said. So microbes uh, have evolved many strategies for dealing with ultraviolet light. And in test chambers, some of those UV adapted microbes have been subject to Mars-like levels of UV and done okay. And so part of it is in a microorganism that's a colony, the outer layer acts as a kind of shield against the UV protecting the interior. Other strategies include hiding behind mineral grains that do transmit sunlight. But ultimately, we would like either an ozone layer to develop on Mars, which one would expect to happen as the oxygen level increases or to use some kind of aerosols as sunscreen separate from the aerosols that are producing the warming. Now, about keeping the nano rods suspended in the Martian atmosphere, you're eventually going to end up with a water cycle, and it almost seems like something that's going to rain out. How do you deal with that? And what is the, the specific conditions Mars is presenting as far as keeping these things, these, these clouds aloft? Well, they eventually settle out. So... You don't want the particles to persist indefinitely in the environment. So actually, we've been discussing different strategies for making sure that they break down. One obvious one is Mars atmosphere has a little bit of oxygen. And so if they oxidize, then they'll eventually break down into small fragments. Another is, as you said, once you get a cycle involving liquid water going, if you make parts or all of the aerosol water soluble, then that would be another way of making sure they don't build up indefinitely. But yeah, since even under dry conditions, they will settle out eventually, just as does natural mass dust, you will have to keep producing them indefinitely. And so an an analogy here might be Earth's nitrogen cycle, which is largely human dominated at this point, where we use the harbor process to produce most of the fixed nitrogen that ends up inside you and me. In the same way, I think you would have to continuously produce some warming agent if you wanted to keep Mars terraformed. This is different from the 1970s vision of Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan, who was one of the first people to suggest that Mars could be terraformed, had in mind that there was huge reservoirs of carbon dioxide in the polar caps that once released would stay released, and so you wouldn't need continued intervention. But we now know from radar mapping that Although there are carbon dioxide reservoirs in the polar caps, they're not as big as would be needed to make that self-sustaining feedback flow. Yeah, I remember all of that well with with Carl Sagan and and the idea of uh, that Mars could be warmed with greenhouse gases alone, but that that stashed now <laughs> as we learned more. Now this is going to be another question for both of you, and I'll start with Edwin. Genetic modification of organisms to live on Mars and are, you know, we adapt them to better survive there. In other words, do you think that's going to be an essential? So we take cyanobacteria or whatever we want, photosynthesizing organisms, and we make them, we tweak them to be better for this newly forming up Martian environment. Do you see that as being on the table? Not my speciality, but it's amazing how far already we've got in synthetic biology on Earth. And an organization that is working on synthetic biology for Mars is Pioneer Labs in San Francisco. They're a philanthropically funded focused research organization working on just that, adapting Earth microbes for Mars conditions. Yeah, it it seems like it's certainly something we would want to look into. Your view on this, Robin? Yeah, I I think it's a fascinating topic. Very nascent. There hasn't really been a ton of work done on this so far, but life 
on Earth, our current biosphere has, has evolved to be optimized for Earth-like conditions. And so we still have a very little sense of, of what biospheres that, that could thrive on other worlds with different habitability boundary conditions would be like. And the, the ex expansion of humans beyond Earth, when, when it happens, it's ultimately expansion of, of life itself. We are part of the biosphere on Earth. And so our survival on Earth requires an ecosystem. And I think that once we're beyond Earth, we're going to require an ecosystem as well. So I expect this is an area which is which is going to grow in the future. Seems like it's inevitable. <laughs> I don't think we're going to I don't think we're going to escape it. We're going to have to discuss it. And one could even play with ideas of can you modify a human to be better suited for Mars and questions like that. What is your view, Robin, on the current push towards Mars exploration? In other words, to put it simply, NASA plans to go there, put boots on the ground and come back or SpaceX and form up a colony as quickly as we can feasibly do it. Yeah, I think Mars exploration is incredibly important, of course, because I'm a planetary scientist and I work in this area. I think scientifically we have so much to learn about Mars still. And so anything that, that gets us more science data on Mars, I'm really excited about. The, the science case for sending humans is, is really strong, even with current advances in robotics and AI. There's, there's still things that humans can do on the surface that, that can't be done otherwise. And so even the first human mission, I think, would be a real leap forward in terms of what we're able to learn about both Mars today and it, it, its past environments. And then beyond that, permanent human settlements on Mars, I, I think that it's something that is going to happen in the future. I think if it's done in the right way, it's it, it's going to be very exciting. I think that it does need to be approached in the right way. And so that's where it, it's fantastic that there's different organizations pursuing this. It's it's going to be great if we can have, you know, robust engagement from, from the science community and like ultimately civil society and things as well, because this is this is when it happens, it's going to be something for all humanity. Edwin, your view on this? Yes, I agree completely. You know, Mars is common heritage of humankind. The current era of robotic exploration is absolutely fascinating. A frontier is the exploration of the deep subsurface. It's possible that there are liquid water aquifers dating from the early times when Mars was habitable down there. I think we should figure that out. And if there are liquid water aquifers down there, then the exploration could take priorities certainly over any global climate change efforts. But what we have learned is that Mars was habitable, at least intermittently, early in its history, but it isn't today. And on one level, that is a, a, a tragedy. 10 million gigawatts of solar energy is what powers everything that we value on Earth. You know, both the wilderness, the farmland, the cities, it's all really running on that 10 million gigawatts of solar energy. But that's the same amount of energy that falls on Mars's surface, and at the moment, not much is happening with that energy. And so I think that will, or certainly that's motivating for me to look into ways that we might make better use of that energy in the, in the future. Well, the one thing about this is, and I think a lot of people make a little bit more of a, a big deal about this than they probably should, because ultimately, if Mars is truly sterile still, and it doesn't have microbes living in an aquifer deep below the surface or something like that. Open question. But if it is truly sterile, it's a rock. <laughs> it's just a rock and we should make use of it. But what if it turns out that there are, there's a second abiogenesis there? In other words, microbes of a completely different origin from Earth. Should we take that into account and suspend any colonization efforts and terraforming efforts with Mars? Maybe I can attempt an answer at this first. So go for it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I think the first of all, discovery of life beyond Earth, any form of life, even the simplest microbe, would be just absolutely stunning and groundbreaking, and uh, probably the biggest revolution since the Copernican Revolution, if not before that. It, it, it would be absolutely huge. And so there's a reason that, that scientists, particularly astrobiologists, care so much about planetary protection. It's because Mars, despite all the challenges we see with habitability on the surface today, it's still one of the best locations in the solar system to, to look for extant life, by which we mean life that's still living today. And 
it, it's a place we can go and actively search for it. To my mind, we actually haven't done that enough yet. So one thing I try to advocate for when I can is that the, this next maybe 10 years, 15 years is a really great window for missions to look directly for life on, on the Martian surface and in the Martian subsurface. And so some of this is planned already. So ESA has this, this very exciting Rosalind Franklin mission in the works. And of course, NASA has rovers, that, including Perseverance, which are currently looking for ancient life. China and uh, a few other countries are also building exciting Mars programs at the moment. But this really is the time for us to, to be going after life on, on, on Mars and really trying to say, is it present on the surface anywhere? Could it be present in the subsurface? I think that that process has to play out and there will come a point once we've done those missions where we, we have an answer to that question. And so once, once that happens, we'll have a much clearer idea about, about how to proceed. And there's all sorts of philosophical debates you can have about, about like how you would prioritize life, extant life on Mars versus long-term settlement efforts. Personally, I think that it would be very important to have robust protection for, for habitats for life if it was discovered. But ultimately, that, that will be a, a question for the, the whole community once we get to that point. Edwin, your view? I, I think personally, we should figure that out first. Uh, ultimately, and see if that's the case or if it actually is just a sterile planet. And if it has fossils, that would be amazing. But if it, we should figure out if it has extant life still and preserve it. That's my view. Edwin, your view on this. Yeah, I agree, John. You know, if we prove a positive, that becomes the most important thing. Following up that discovery would be a very big deal. Of course, you can't prove a negative, <laughs> but we do have a precedent, which is the gradual consensus that Earth's moon doesn't have life. That didn't happen right at the start of the space age. Re remember, the Apollo astronauts came back and they went right into quarantine for a couple of weeks. And it's only you know with the gradual accumulation of time and evidence over you know more than a decade that it was agreed that the moon doesn't have life. And so I don't think there's going to be a moment when everyone stands up and says Mars is sterile because you can't prove a negative. But that's the other possible path would be something like what happened to Earth's moon. I think that they put a little bit too much emphasis on that sort of sterilization idea because Earth and Mars both have been sneezing on each other for four and a half billion years through panspermia and possibilities like that. I mean, it's even, it is even plausible that life on Earth was deposited here and it actually started on Mars. And I don't know that there is any such thing as truly sterile. <laughs> Even, even the moon, I, I imagine that you're going to find earth rocks or something that, that have the remains of bacteria, you know, tardigrades or something sitting there. You know, it's not viable, but <laughs> it's probably going to be there. So I don't think there really is anything such thing as a sterile star system that has life in it. Would you agree with that, Edwin, or disagree? And then we'll turn it over to Robin and give me your view. Oh, yeah. When Apollo astronauts visited one of the Surveyor spacecraft, some of the metal panels they returned from three years of exposure on the moon still had spores on them that could be cultivated in an Earth environment. But those spores didn't grow while they were on the moon. And I guess that's the threshold. Robin, your yeah, thoughts? so this this um, panspermia idea has, has been around for a while. I think I think it's a good one. And there's even been the idea put forward that Maybe life started on Mars and then transferred to Earth afterwards. There's a lot of interest in what prebiotic chemistry on, on early Mars might look like. And again, I think one of the very exciting things about the rovers, and in particular the Mars sample return, is that we're going to be able to look for conditions on very early Mars where origin of life might in fact have occurred. I will say I would like to see more modeling of this idea. There's There's been some kind of... And I specifically mean like if you have ejection of rocks from a planet into orbit and, and then transfer to another body, the, the, there's, there's been a bit of work done on it. But I think that it would be good for us to get a better handle on the physics of this because there's there's still quite a few uncertainties. But with what we know right now, at least it's fair to say that, yeah, it's totally possible that you can have transfer of material from uh, among different objects in the solar system. And that's probably been going on since the the solar system formed. <laughs> Robin, that goes back to Venus. Uh, yeah, many objects in the solar system, but probably not Venus because of that atmosphere. I don't think that you could get <laughs> a rock off the surface of Venus <laughs> and have it survive 
enough to where it ends up in space <laughs> uh maybe if it's a huge one i don't know um and maybe early in its history but that brings up a weird thought this star system while we know mars looked like earth as a water world at one at some point you know in, in its distant past and we clearly see the activities of liquid water i know some people debate that but clearly we see riverbeds and you know the activities of uh, past water there then we have earth which obviously is oceanic and you know the blue jewel and then we have the idea that venus might have been more clement towards life early in its history and may have also had water and been an ocean world although that's much less clear that is three liquid water surface planets <laughs> in one star system does that tell you that when you look at exoplanets out in the universe that we should really expect to see a stage of water in the lifetime of a terrestrial world being normal at least around a g-type star and probably a k-type star do you think that we should just expect to see water worlds terrestrial water worlds as we get further into the task of characterizing exoplanet atmospheres yeah that's a that's a really interesting question i mean i think one of the first points is that Water is a, a very common compound. I mean, H and O are both very common elements. And so H2O in, in usually in, in solid form, but it, it varies. We see it, we see it all over the place because it's it's just something that through stellar nuclear synthesis is because it, it is very common in the galaxy in general. And then so specific conditions for liquid water, that's gives you a narrower region because you have to have the right temperature and pressure range, but there's been a lot of work done on this now, particularly for exoplanets and modeling the habitable zone and the like. So to be clear, when we say habitable zone, what we mean is the, the region, the estimated region of, of distances from a host star where, where liquid water can be present. I think there's every reason to expect right now that there's going to be a large number of exoplanets that, that have surface liquid water. I think the story for habitability doesn't end there because actually some interesting things start to happen when you think about real ocean worlds. I mean, we call Earth a water world, but it is compared to, to Venus and, and Mars today. But by some other standards, it's actually quite water poor. You can, it's, it's likely that there are exoplanets out there that where a big fraction of their entire mass is water. And then so if you had a completely global ocean, yes, there could be situations where you have a global ocean of liquid water, but it, it it might be very different from an Earth-like planet. And th th that carbon cycle that we talked about a bit earlier, that, for example, would change completely if you never didn't have any land present and you, you just had ocean everywhere. And so I suspect liquid water is pretty common across the galaxy in general, but I think the story for habitability doesn't stop there. You have to think about other things as well. Very exciting times that we can actually just now begin to probe that with the James Webb Telescope. Edwin, your view on this, do you think that uh, we will find water worlds that Mars formerly was, Venus may have formerly been, and Earth is? Do you think that's something that we're going to see? Well, going beyond Mars, you find world-spanning oceans uh, right away. So uh, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto, Titan, and Enceladus all have global liquid water layers beneath an ice cover. And in the case of Enceladus, we get free samples of the ocean because it's erupting through vents at the South Pole. Analysis of the chemistry of the erupting seawater shows that Earth microbes could have do fine uh, from an energetic perspective within that ocean. Although, as Robin says, there are many other ingredients you have to track, like the phosphorus abundance and so on. No, no reason why Earth microbes wouldn't do fine in Enceladus's ocean. And so that's a great target for astrobiological exploration, very carefully, with carefully sterilized spacecraft in order not to contaminate that ocean with our own form of life. Of course, of course, sterilization of the Earth life, because we know this planet has <laughs> plenty of microbes and we don't want to uh, contaminate our experiment or detection or anything like that. But that's in the future, because ultimately, I think that the the ice shell moons, at least with Enceladus and Europa, they're pluming. You know, we have plumes that we can fly through and study and not really risk contamination. And it's going to be really exciting as we do that. Now, my final question for you, gentlemen, is this. And Rob and I will start with you. And then Edwin, we, I will ask you the same question. I started out as a science fiction author. And then I ended up with 
YouTube shows and things like that. One of the things that I think about a lot are techno signatures, and it seems to me a changing Mars into something that it should not naturally be in nature. You know, it is right now what it should naturally be in nature, but if it ends up with a weird oxygenated atmosphere and a weird just signatures, you know, changing, that seems to be the impossible planet. In other words, that seems to be a candidate for an alien techno signature. Should we see a planet like this that just doesn't make any sense because it's in the wrong position for what it is? Do you think that's a viable techno signature, Robin? Ah, uh, good question. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I've done, I haven't, my group hasn't done a ton of work on techno signatures. We have worked quite a lot on biosignatures and in particular cases where you have false biosignatures. So that is something that you think is a sign of light, but it, it turns out not to be because, and obviously that's a very important thing to, to, to care about if you're, if you're looking for, a, you know, like a smoking gun detection. Oxygen actually is one of the things that we've highlighted that you can generate in the absence of life. And so I think it probably could be possible on, on a planet like Mars to, to generate it without life being present. There are other things which have been put forward as techno signatures and particularly people have looked at greenhouse gases. Some of them, the greenhouse gases that have been proposed in the past for Mars terraforming that there's just no feasible way to to create them without life or even without uh, it's argued intelligent life and so probably going after something like that would would be your best bet if you were trying to look for a, for a terraformed world for aerosol particles i i don't know i think edwin would be a good person to ask about that edwin your view if you terraform mars and aliens from 100 light years away see that planet changing from what it used to be do you think that's a, a viable techno signature or do you think it would just be constantly called into question if we ever saw anything like that our current telescopes like james webb are only marginally capable of looking for biosignatures on a handful of the most favorable for observed worlds so a techno signature and on top of biosignature hunt would require next generation telescopes. But if such a search was carried out, we should, you know, bear in mind the history of Mars science in that, uh, you know, a very good telescope observer fooled himself into thinking that he saw canals on Mars, uh, when in fact there, there were no canals and it was all explained by non-biological processes like uh, seasonal ice deposition. And so any technical signature search will have to consider false positives so it will have to be done very carefully because the list of false positives will be long. And we probably don't even know all of the possible false positives yet. <laughs> so you know, we just don't know. But but the process will be fun. The process will be fun in, in figuring it out. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. And what exciting work. I, I was compelled by both ideas because admittedly, when it appeared that Mars didn't really have the reserves of locked up gases to you know do it the standard way by releasing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere with I, I think some people were even saying nuclear bombs and you know things like that but now we have a technological way two technological ways in which we could very dramatically improve our chances of actually creating mars colony i look forward to it it's very exciting times indeed and thank you both for appearing thank you yeah thanks a lot fun discussion Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.